Hi, my name is Daria. I'm a colorist, a compositor, and a DaVinci Resolve master trainer. And today I'll be taking you through DaVinci Resolve's color page. So if you look at my workstation, I've already got DaVinci Resolve launched, and I'm currently on uh, the project manager panel. In order to open the project file that I would have shared with you on the training page, uh, you need to right click in the project manager and select restore project archive. An archive is a little bit different from a regular project file because it doesn't just contain the metadata for the project and all its timelines, but also all the media within that project. So within my documents, I can see I have color page underscore video uh, part one dot DRA. Uh, you don't need to enter that folder. You just need to select it on the surface, highlight it, and click open. It'll take a few moments and you should then see a thumbnail of the project open in the project manager. To enter, you have to double click the thumbnail. All right. So when a DaVinci Resolve launches, it will place you in the last page that you had open. In my case, it was the color page, uh, but if you need to um, situate yourself here, uh, look at the bottom of the program and check to see which icon you have selected. So I have uh, color highlighted. Make sure you either uh, click on color or the little uh, color wheel if you don't have labels. By the way, if you'd like to see labels, uh, you can right click at the very bottom of the program and you'll see that you have options to, sh uh, to show icons only or to show icons and labels. Okay. So in the color page, uh, I have the standard layout. Uh, if you're seeing something different, you can navigate to the very top of the program go into your workspace menu and choose Reset UI or User Interface Layout. And then you should be seeing the exact same distribution of panels as I am. Now, at first, uh, the color page might look quite busy, maybe a bit intimidating if it's your first time looking at it, but um, it's actually much easier to approach if you think of it as a series of relatively simple tools, all of which have you know just one or two functions uh, that have all just been amassed together on this page. So once you start learning them one at a time, uh, it's much easier to approach. Let's take a look at the standard panels. At the very top of the page, you have uh, three main sections. You have the gallery in the top left corner where you're gonna be storing your stills. Uh, stills are a way for us to grab high quality image grabs of frames from our clips, but they're also a way of saving our grades, you know, so we can then reuse them at a later time or with different clips on the timeline. In the middle, we have the viewer, which I think is uh, pretty self-explanatory. It's showing us our color grade as we perform it but it also offers a lot of additional functionality based on which panel uh, you currently have active or which tool you're using. So it's actually quite reactive uh, to whichever tools are in operation. And then in the top right corner, you have the node editor. This is where you're going to be uh, creating uh, steps for your grades to ensure that your grade is nice and clean and uh, that your image uh, signal integrity is preserved. So that's something I will go into much more detail uh, later on, uh, but just keep in mind that this is pretty much where the magic happens. Underneath the viewer, you have two forms of the timeline. You have the thumbnail timeline, which is, uh, represented with these larger thumbnails that you can click amongst, either with your mouse, or you can use the arrow keys on your keyboard to navigate between the different clips of the edit. You can also use the left and right key to navigate between frames. Underneath the thumbnail timeline, you have the timeline ruler. Now this looks a little bit more like the timeline on the edit page, in which you can see the duration of the clips, their relationship to one another, uh, and different video tracks. Um, so you don't always need to see the duration of clips when you're color grading, uh, but if you did, uh, then you can refer to this uh, timeline at the bottom. You can also select the playhead and drag to navigate between the media clips. And then finally, in the bottom third of the page, you have your collection of palettes, which is all the tools that you're gonna to be using in the color page. If you are using a desktop resolution of 1920 by 1080 and above, then you will see a distribution of like three columns of these palettes. But if you have a smaller resolution, then you'll find your palettes collected into just two columns, left and right. To navigate between uh, the different palettes or tools, you need to click on the icons above the palettes and that will show you all the different tools that you have access to. 
Uh, by default, you will have uh, the primaries wheels and the curves uh, open at the bottom. And then on the right-hand side, uh, you have some additional tools like the keyframes palette and the scopes, which I'm going to select and leave open. So with the scopes, I can uh, see the analysis of the video, see the signal uh, strength in the luminance and also the red, green, and blue channels, which is going to be really helpful for balancing and ma matching my media. At the very top of the page, as with all the other pages in DaVinci Resolve, you have the interface toolbar, which is this very narrow strip that features a series of buttons that allow you to hide or reveal panels based on what you need to do uh, on the page. So say instead of uh, using the gallery, you needed to have access to your lookup tables or the LUTs panel. You can click on LUTs at the top and see that you now have access to all of your LUT collections but then you can select gallery and that will switch it back. On the right hand side, I have access to my open effects panel, my light box, etc. Another way that you can customize your color page layout is by clicking the edges of certain panels and expanding them. And you'll see that the viewer in this case dynamically resizes itself based on the space that it's allowed. And then if you ever need to reset uh, your layout, you saw at the beginning of this video that you could go into the workspace menu at the top and choose Reset UI Layout. Some other terms that I'm going to be using in this tutorial is options. So the options menu is found in most panels in the top right corner, and it looks like these three dots. So these options menus tend to give you a bit more control over individual panels let you enable certain modes or deactivate certain features. You also have pop-up menus, which you will find uh, in the top right of some of the palettes, and they have a little drop-down arrow next to them. So with these, you can switch between different pages of a palette. For example, with the curves, we have a lot of HSL curves that we have access to. We can use this drop-down menu to navigate, uh, but then it also has a corresponding dot menu at the very top of the palette with which you can navigate between the different pages of the palettes. So again, you will find these uh, in different uh, palettes. If I go back to my scopes, I will find this also has a pop-up menu for the different types of scopes that I have. And same thing for the primaries. And then finally, we also have contextual menus. Uh, these are also known as right-click menus. Whenever you right-click in an area of the color page, you will find a selection of additional commands. Uh, but what's interesting about this menu is that it changes based on where you click. So you will have access to different commands or actions based on the element that you're right-clicking on. All right, now that we're familiar with the layout, we can start looking at our primary grading tools. When we talk about primary grading tools, uh, we talk about making changes to the entire frame of the image. So uh, we could do this for a variety of reasons. Uh, the main two is, first of all, corrective. So this is where we want to balance the image, match it to another uh, clip in the timeline, uh, get rid of any color cast that may have been captured in camera, basically make it look as nice and clean as possible. And then there's also the creative reason for primary grading. So this is where you design a look and you want it to affect the entire frame or the entire scene. We perform primary grading uh, with a whole combination of tools, but really the most common ones is the primary color wheels and the curves that are open by default in the color page. So you see these currently open uh, at the bottom of my color page. I've also got scopes open, uh, which I like to use in order to properly analyze and understand what's happening in the frame. I'm going to navigate to the first uh, clip on my timeline, and I'm also going to change my scope type. Right now, we're looking at an RGB parade, which is giving us a readout of the color intensity of the red, green, and blue channel. This is really helpful for uh, certain workflows, especially when we're matching clips. But in my case, I just want to focus on the tonal range of the image. So I will switch from parade to waveform. There we go. And it's currently giving me a single video a readout of this frame with the red, green, and blue channels superimposed. I might want to change this to give me just a luminance readout. So I will go into my settings at the top, switch from RGB to Y, 
and disable colorize. There we go. So we have this floating uh, settings menu, which I can pick up with my mouse and move aside. And you can see that the scopes in the background uh, no longer have any colors. They're just a white readout. Um, if I wanted to increase the intensity of this trace, then I could go into my waveform parameter here and brighten it up. So now I have a really bright uh, trace in the background. So trace is what we call the graph that's giving us a readout of our video signal. And then to collapse the settings, I just have to click anywhere outside of that box and they will automatically go back to where they came from. So what are the scopes actually telling us? Uh, you read them uh, from left and right uh, across the image. So imagine your eye traveling from the left side of the frame to the right. And then top to bottom, they're representing the luminance of the image. So zero at the very bottom represents the black point. This is the darkest that a pixel can possibly be. Right, so usually that's a value of zero, zero, zero for red, green, and blue. Then opposite that, at the very top of the graph, will be the white point or the brightest possible uh, value that a pixel can be. So as you're reading this graph, you should see that there's a few very distinct shapes, uh, especially these little pillars falling towards the bottom of the graph. And when we look at the image, we will find that as we travel from left and right, uh, there are these areas of dark shadow in between uh, these wooden pillars, right? So where there is shadow, the pixels are being reorganized and placed towards the bottom of the scopes graph to tell us that these are dark regions. Whereas in between these shadowy areas, we have a pretty neutral spread of pixels where there isn't really anything distinctly bright or dark. So they're all, they're all kind of bunching around the midtone. And if you look in the scopes, that's also quite well represented in this graph. So they're all just a little bit elevated, but they're not necessarily bright, right? So they're not being thrown all the way to the top of the scopes panel. With this kind of readout, uh, we can understand exactly how we need to adjust our primaries controls to get a nice spread in the image, but make sure that it's not too bright, it's not blown out, and it's also not too dark, that we're not uh, crushing the shadows. So for that, I'm going to use uh, the primaries color wheels. Now, there's a lot going on here at first, uh, so let's first understand what the individual wheels are doing. On the right-hand side, you have the offset wheel. This is one that will impact the entire image uniformly. If I click the control point in the middle of the wheel, I can hold and drag in any direction, and you will see that I'm introducing that color into the image in the viewer. I can also double click the control point in the color wheel to reset it back to its original position. Underneath the color wheel, we have this black slider, which is called a master wheel, and this will affect the luminance of your image. If I click and hold it, I can drag left to darken my frame, or I can keep holding it and drag right to brighten the frame. Notice that the trace in the scopes is moving uniformly up and down. So that's exactly what the offset does. Uh, it will impact your image uniformly regardless of how light or dark it is or how many shadows it has or highlight points. To reset uh, my settings, I'm going to go into the top right corner and click this round arrow to reset my parameters. Every wheel, by the way, has its own reset arrow. Plus you have a global reset in the top right corner of the primaries palette, as well as most other palettes that allow you to reset the entire palette. So on uh, the left-hand side, you have three more color wheels, uh, but these ones have distinct tonal ranges. So they will impact a, uh, an area of the image based on its luminance. Uh, these are called lift, gamma, and gain. And a shorthand way of remembering what they do is that lift uh, will control shadows, gamma goes after midtones, and gain goes after highlights. So if I was to click and drag the lift color wheel, I will find that uh, the shadows between uh, the fence posts get affected more dramatically and they start to go red, whereas the highlights are the last thing to get affected. And likewise, I can use the master wheels underneath uh, those color wheels to then make the shadows even darker, but then go in the opposite direction towards the gain and make the highlights brighter, and thus establishing contrast in the image.
So if I'm going to be using the scopes uh, as a reference for you know, how to distribute or normalize this image, um, I will make sure that my shadows are not touching the black point line, um, especially during this point uh, in time where I'm only balancing the image. I'm not really applying a creative grade. I'm going to drag the master wheel slightly to the right to land uh, this trace right between the bottom two lines uh, of my scopes graph. And then I'm going to do the opposite for the gain master wheel. I'm going to drag it upwards to brighten the video. And normally I would want to land uh, most uh, signals right under the second uh, line from the top uh, of the scopes graph. But in this case, because it's already a very dark image and uh, because we don't really have a good reference for a well uh, lit item, like a piece of paper or a color chart, I'm going to keep it a little bit darker. And instead, I'm just going to use uh, the highlight on this hand as a reference for brightness, which I don't really want to take over 75%. So that's this area of the graph. You can see there's very few pixels representing that particular region, which is why it's uh, quite faint. But hopefully you can see that's just about touching 75%, and that's as high uh, as I will want to take it. If I feel that the image is still a little bit dark, I can still uh, brighten it up by going after the gamma master wheel, dragging that slightly to the right, and bringing the middle part of the trace upwards a bit. At the top and the bottom of the primaries palette, you have your adjustment controls. So these are single purpose parameters that will further affect the image in uh, some way. For example, we have a temperature control, which I can drag to the left in order to cool down the image or drag to the right uh, to warm it up. This is very commonly used for getting rid of a temperature or a color cast in the image if a camera was not properly white balanced uh, when recording. One way that I can make changes to these parameters is to click and drag with my mouse. I can also click and drag on the parameter name itself. So by clicking temp, I can still change these values. And finally, I can also click on the numeric field that the parameter is in and type in a value with my number pad. And then when I press enter, that's uh, applied. To reset any of the parameters, you need to double click the parameter name. So I'm gonna double click temp, and then that takes me to the default value of zero. In this case, what I would like to do is increase the saturation of my image. Because I had a log starting point, uh, the image was quite uh, flat, not just in terms of contrast, but also in terms of color. So I will go down here to the bottom uh, adjustment controls and increase my saturation to 75. So I'm just gonna lift it up to about three quarters. I'll enter 75 on my number pad, press enter, and you should see that a little bit more color has returned to the image. Now that I've raised the saturation on the image, um, I start to reveal uh, more of the original colors and any color cast or inconsistencies that may have been captured. So how do we balance this image? Uh, there's a lot of different approaches, uh, but we're gonna go for one of the simpler ones that involves using the data that's already in the viewer. I am going to navigate to the viewer with my mouse and I'm going to right click and in the contextual menu, I will choose show picker RGB value. And what that means is that when I hover over the pixels in the viewer, I will now get an RGB readout uh, of the values of whatever pixel I'm currently hovering over. And this will give me a representation of uh, whether there's a color dominance in any particular pixel. Now, in certain regions, that dominance makes a lot of sense. If I'm placing my mouse over that plank of wood, you know, wood tends to be warmer, so it will have a stronger red dominance. It will have less blue. Uh, likewise, for this jumper, uh, you can see that it's naturally blue in color, which is why the blue value will be highlighted. Uh, when you're trying to neutralize an image or balance it, you are trying to look at elements that should naturally be grayscale or neutral. So for example, white pieces of paper, white t-shirts, of course, color charts, if you have them. Uh, in this case, we don't have any of that, but we do have a rhinoceros. And we can realistically assume that uh, his skin tone is gonna be somewhere in that grayscale range. So I'm going to hover over it and make sure that I'm not seeing a color dominance. 
when I do this, um, I see that my red channel is always about 10 points higher than my green and my blue, no matter where I place it really. So that's an indication that the image overall probably has a red color cast. I am going to navigate into my primaries and what I can do is uh, grab my color wheel. Uh, probably my gain would be a really good approach because uh, the gain is representing the light source, um, you know, hitting the environment. And I will want to pull it away from red to get rid of that color cast. Uh, but it's a little bit harder to do within a wheel because you're kind of moving, you know, with these three dimensional colors, you know, so it's a little bit more abstract. The wheels are great for creative color grading, but when it comes to precision, uh, maybe not so much. So we're going to switch our mode from wheels to bars. If you go into your pop up menu, under wheels, you will see bars. These are also known as printer lights, and these will allow you to adjust very specific color casts uh, in your tonal ranges. So in this case, again, we're going after the gain, which uh, represents the highlights of the image, and that is anything that's being affected by the light source, which of course is the rhino and everything in the scene. And we are going to drag down in the red channel to remove some of that red dominance. To interact with bars, you can either click and drag down with your mouse, or you can also use the scroll wheel, which will give you much finer control over the values, you know, so it won't be as aggressive. So as I scroll, um, I can see my image becoming more and more cyan, which is the opposite of red. I'll make sure that I don't pull it down far enough to reveal that blue. And instead, I'll just make a very minor adjustment. As you can see, the red's not too different yet. Then navigate back to the viewer with my mouse and double check what the values are looking like. And now they are overall uh, much, much closer to the green and the blue values. Still a little bit heightened. So I can probably take it down just one more notch, but otherwise I'm pretty, pretty happy with this result. With my image normalized and balanced, I am now ready to apply a creative look. Uh, for that, I will probably want to create a new node. I don't want to work on top of the changes that I've already made. I don't want to undo anything that I've done in my color wheels. So I'm going to go into the node editor, right click, add node, and add serial. So I won't spend too much time talking about node structures uh, in this video, but for now it's uh, really good to think of nodes as organizational tools. You know, the fact that you're going to have a separate node for every stage of your workflow, and you're going to use them to keep track of where you performed certain grades so that you can return to them in future and know exactly, you know, where you created contrast, where you created balance. And that way it's much easier to modify, you know, not lose track of your tools. Um, to help me with that, I am also going to start labeling nodes. So the first node uh, that I had open, number one, you could see there's a little icon at the very bottom that's representing the tools that I've already used on that node. When I hover over it, it's telling me that I've used primary balance and I've also used the adjustment controls, you know, so that includes things like, you know, saturation and luminance mix. I am going to right click node number one, choose node label, and I will just start typing balance. So that was my cleanup node. This is where I was preparing it for the eventual color grade. Now with the video signal nice and cleaned up, I can select node number two and I'm going to label that look. By the way, um, if you ever wanted to disable your color grade to see, you know, what your image looked like before you started working, you can always click on the number of a node to disable it. So now you can see this is our original image. It was much darker, much flatter. And when I enable balance, you can see now it's looking quite clean, neutral, and also the luminance spread is much more natural looking. I can also use the shortcut uh, Command D on a Mac or Control D on a PC to do the same thing without clicking on the node. I'm now going to select my look node and uh, create some sort of look. Um, I think first thing uh, that I really want to do is establish a deeper contrast because it's still looking a little bit uh, flat to me even though it's looking uh, natural now. So at the very top of the primaries palette in the adjustment controls, you will find that there are these two parameters called contrast and pivot. I can click and drag contrast 
and that will push the top and bottom of the trace further away from each other, as you can see in the scopes. Um, so what contrast does is it increases the difference between the lightest part of the image and the darkest part of the image. And that then reveals more detail in the midtones. It makes the image look more interesting. It reveals, uh, you know, the wrinkles in the rhino. Um, it also creates much deeper shadows. Sometimes, though, uh, that does result in your image looking overall uh, too dark or too light. And for that, we have the pivot, uh, which you can think of as a balance tool for the contrast. So rather than placing the contrast uh, in the middle of the luminance range, it will actually prioritize either the highlights or the shadows. So I can click pivot and drag, and you can see that even though the contrast is maintained, I can overall make the image brighter or darker. So I'll make mine just a little bit darker, and I'm pretty happy with that result. To introduce a creative color cast, I'm going to go back into the wheels uh, in order to play uh, with the colors like in a non-linear fashion. So once again, that's our pop-up menu in the top right corner. I'll select wheels to return. And I'm going to apply the color to the overall frame using the offset. I'm going to click on the control point in the middle of the color wheel and drag it a little bit towards like a cyan tone. So that's a, like a warm blue or greenish blue. Okay. And whenever I perform creative color grading, uh, my left hand pretty much lives on the keyboard on the command D shortcut or control D on PC so that I'm constantly comparing before and after as I'm working. And that way it refreshes my eyes and my mind and it lets me know if I've taken the grade too far and it's starting to look unrealistic or, you know, just bad <laughs> or distracting. So in this case, I'm still okay with it. It is a very strong look, but maybe, you know, that was my intention for this scene. So I'm happy with it. Um, as well as dragging the offset towards uh, cyan, I'm also going to drag the shadows towards red in order to counteract some of that blueness and make the shadows appear more neutral. Okay, so then overall that has a pretty positive impact on the image. It's giving us like a bit of a, a dual tone. So it still looks quite unique, uh, quite different from the original video signal, but it's, it's looking quite natural to my eyes. And then finally, I'm also going to adjust the mid-tone detail. This is a parameter in the top right corner, and it's going to have the effect of sharpening the image. Even though it's technically not a sharpening tool, it is also a contrast adjustment, but it targets uh, areas of the image that are naturally high in detail. So uh, mid-tones, uh, like the scratches on the posts, uh, like the rhino's skin, those are all going to be affected and their contrast is going to be raised. And that will produce the effect of increased sharpness. So I'm going to click and drag. And you can see if I take it really quite far, then it, the image starts to look extremely dramatic. I'm going to dial it back to about maybe about 40 points and again, Press Command D to bypass the node, or if I'm not using shortcuts, you can just click on the number of the node too to do the same thing and compare before and after. All right, and that was our first exercise. Let's move on to clip number two. For clip number two, we're going to be using the curves palette. This is uh, the other primary palette that everyone should know uh, for color grading. It is just like the color wheels used for both uh, correction work, for balancing, but then also for creative uh, looks and designs. So here we're gonna do uh, a very similar thing, just with an alternative approach. Let's first get comfortable with uh, the interface. Uh, one thing I can do with the curves is I can actually pop out the palette in case I need more control uh, over the individual curves. So in the top right corner, you will see this little icon that looks like four arrows pointing in different directions. When I click on it, I expand the palette and I can now reposition it by grabbing it by the header, or I can click the bottom left corner and resize it so that I can fit it wherever I need it on the page. You have uh, complete control over the individual channels, uh, the color channels that you work on. In the top right corner, you can see that by default, these are all linked or ganged together, but you can also select that little chain icon to disable it and see that you can navigate between the different channels of the image. 
I'll relink these as I continue. Now, the main portion of the palette is taken up by the curve itself. And uh, this bears a lot of similarities to the scopes graph that we just looked at. So the very bottom of this graph represents the uh, hypothetical black point of the image and uh, will impact the shadows. If I select this point and I drag it upwards, I am brightening the shadows. If you look at the scopes graph, you will see that this image is getting brighter from the bottom upwards. Likewise, I can drag the control point across the bottom and that will have the opposite effect. It will deepen the shadows, it will bring them down in the scopes. The same is uh, true for the opposite. At the very top, we have our white point control. I can drag it across the top to raise my trace and eventually overexpose it and completely crush the image. Um, or I can drag it downwards in order to darken the image. So using uh, these two control points, I can very easily establish a tonal range distribution where I can normalize the image um, or uh, create contrast. What's really special about the Curves palette is that I can also create uh, as many control points within the curve as I want, um, and thereby I can make very customized grades, uh, both for balancing and for creative looks. Uh, it means that if there's a very specific portion of the image that I need to target that I'm finding very difficult to adjust with the color wheels, I can switch to the curves and make adjustments to that very distinct range. To create new control points, all I have to do is click on the curve and start to drag up or down to lighten or darken it. But then I can create more points to start creating looks. You can remove points by right-clicking them with your mouse. So I'm going to begin by dragging the black and white point uh, to normalize uh, the waveform in the scopes. Remember, we don't want to crush the shadows. We just want to land them somewhere safely between the 0 and the 128 line. So I'm going to drag that point and place it right over there. And then I'll do the opposite for the white point. I'm going to drag it until the very top of the trace is somewhere under or on the second horizontal line from the top. Uh, so we absolutely don't want to be crushing this because we will be losing a lot of data here and that tends to look quite rough. It tends to look a bit unprofessional. Uh, so ideally, even the highlights we want to keep quite well preserved. And you can see right now uh, that area in the window is starting to look like a block of white pixels, which we absolutely do not want. So I'll pick it up and drag it downwards. And we tend to be a little bit more precious with highlights than with shadows. So instead of uh, placing it somewhere in between, I'm actually going to drag it a little bit lower to make sure that we preserve as much detail out of that window as possible. Hopefully by now you're feeling more comfortable with referring to scopes and reading them. If we're reading it from left to right, then we can see that there's a great area of raised pixels on the left-hand side. And if we look on the left-hand side of the image in the viewer, then you will see the brightest spot in this uh, room, which is, of course, an open window. So it all makes sense. Uh, the rest of the image is relatively flat, so there's not too many uh, distinct shadows or highlights. But then as you travel across to the right, you see this really gentle transition from shadow to a lighter portion of the wall. And in scopes graphs, this tends to look like a really gentle gradient, which is exactly what you can see, hopefully, on the right-hand side of the trace. So just a little wave uh, going upwards towards the brightness. All right, so I have uh, stretched the top and bottom of this trace. Sometimes uh, you'll see that a change that you make counteracts a previous change that you had created. So for example, the shadows have now been elevated. And that's perfectly fine. A big part of color grading is reiteration. It's going back to tools that you used earlier and making further changes in order for the final result to look optimal. So I'm going to grab the black point and drag it a little bit lower so that once again, we're filling a, a lower portion of the shadow. And finally, I'm going to create another point in the middle of the curve uh, to control the overall lightness or darkness of the image. So kind of like using the gamma in the color wheels. If I click and drag, you can see that I can brighten the overall room or I can darken it. Um, I can also refer to the histogram that's in the background of the palette. This histogram, uh, you can think of as 
uh, an alternative representation of the image from the scopes, uh, but rather than reading it from top to bottom, we're reading it from left to right, so left representing the shadows, right representing the highlights. So the majority of the image is actually quite low uh, in terms of luminance, it's all the way down here. Um, and if I want to target this region, I need to place the point over here, and you'll see that when I drag it upwards, much more of the image becomes brighter, much more dramatically. So I'm not going to be that intense, uh, but I will lift it up just a touch. I can also perform a balance at this stage, um, but this time instead of using uh, the viewer and the RGB picker, I am going to go back into my scopes settings. Uh, so this is the little icon that looks like three lines. And here I'm going to reactivate my red, green, and blue channels. So instead of using Y, which represents luminance, I'm going to switch to RGB. And I'm also going to select Colorize in my settings so that I can see what these channels look like in the trace. And then once again, I'm going to click Off to remove the settings panel. And I can immediately see that there's a bit of a red dominance in the image. Uh, one thing that's important to keep in mind when you're balancing is to always keep an eye on context. If this was a video of a forest, for example, then I would naturally assume that the green channel would be quite dominant in the scopes, and that's perfectly fine. I wouldn't try to neutralize that. Um, likewise, if we had an image of a blue sky, then the blue channel would be dominant. But in this case, we're looking at the interior of a room. Um, we have like these scales with what we assume to be, you know, like usually they're printed on a, a white piece of plastic or white paper, so that we would assume to be neutral. Uh, there's no reason really for anything in this room to have such a strong red dominance as what we're seeing. So the most likely thing is that we have a color cast. Uh, so we are going to begin by isolating our red channel in the curves by clicking R in the top right. And I am going to reuse the midpoint by selecting it and dragging it slightly down. So you can see how the red channel has separated itself from the previous ganged channels. So green and blue are still there, but red has now started to move on its own. And when I refer to the scopes, I can see that red fringe is starting to disappear a little bit behind the other channels. Whenever you have pure white uh, in the RGB scopes, that's when you know that three channels are perfectly overlaid and you have neutral, you have grayscale. I can also see that I have a bit of a blue fringe at the bottom of this trace, so I will also isolate uh, the blue channel and drag that slightly upwards. All right, and hopefully you can see that uh, the image has become a little bit more neutral. Um, if you need to make further tweaks, uh, then feel free to do so, especially if something doesn't look right in the viewer. Uh, but you can always reliably uh, depend on the scopes to give you uh, an accurate readout, no matter what monitor you're using. So I'm going to press uh, Command D to disable the node to compare before and after. And you can see it feels almost like turning a light on. You know, the image has become much brighter. Uh, the contrast is more defined. It looks more like real life. And also it's been uh, neutralized quite a bit, so it no longer has that kind of yellowish or brownish tinge. Which means that I'm now ready to start performing other actions in terms of uh, creating this look. Um, I really want to create uh, some contrast, but I don't want to keep using uh, the same curves palette because right now you can see it's uh, quite broken up. And if I start to make further adjustments, it's going to be difficult to keep track of what was balancing and what was creative work. So I would rather collapse uh, this palette by clicking on the X in the top left corner and create a new node in which I'm going to um, establish contrast. So I will uh, right-click on my existing node and add a new serial node. So a serial is just uh, a standard corrector node that will appear after the node uh, that you currently have selected. There you go. I will use this node to create contrast, and for that we're also going to be using the Curves palette. And I'll remind myself that the previous node was being used for balance. All right. Whichever node I have selected, so it's highlighted with an orange outline, that's where I will be uh, performing the changes uh, on the palettes. Notice that when I select contrast, which doesn't have any icons at the bottom of it, uh, the curves palette is back to what it used to be, just a straight line um, you know, from one corner to the next. If I switch back to balance, then you can see the changes that I've just made.
So now I can work on contrast without affecting or undoing anything that I did with the balance. I will make sure that uh, my curves are all ganged. Once again, I can expand uh, the palette so it's a little bit easier to modify. And um, I will create what's known as an S-curve. So S-curve is a shorthand way of referring to contrast in an image. Just like the letter S, it implies that you are darkening the lower midtones or the shadows and brightening the upper midtones or the highlights, thereby creating this S shape. So it's a really quick way to establish contrast. Uh, if you have a dark image like this one, you might want to be very gentle with the, the severity of the S shape and keep it quite, quite subtle. I'm pretty happy with the results, so you can see my before and my after. I also want to work on the colors of this image, but again, I don't really want to undo what I've already done. So it's a good idea to, once again, uh, create a new node. But this time, um, I don't want to make changes to the colors uh, after the current node, because I do feel like contrast is a good change to place at the end of a pipeline. Instead, I want to make my color corrections between the balance and the contrast. So for that, I'm going to right-click the contrast node add node, but this time instead of adding serial, I'm going to add serial before. So now a new node has appeared in that connection line between balance and contrast. And this will be my look. Just like with the remainder of the nodes uh, on this particular clip, I'm going to be using the curves palette to create the look. Uh, let me expand uh, the palette one last time. And this time I'll start isolating the channels. What's fun is that uh, if you want to introduce uh, the color of a certain channel, you can select it, create a control point and drag upwards to bring that color in. But when you drag it downwards, you're not just removing the color, you're actually introducing its inverse opposite. So the opposite of green in the additive color space is magenta. So you bring magenta in by dragging in the opposite direction. Um, if you ever have any trouble remembering uh, the different color pairs, you can refer to the color wheels in the primaries and see that, you know, opposite of green is magenta, opposite of red is cyan, it's this light blue, and then opposite of blue is yellow. So if I were to reset these parameters, go to blue, I can introduce blue or yellow. Let me reset. And also introduce red or cyan. A quick way to create a look using the Curves palette is to introduce uh, two opposite colors into opposing tonal ranges of an image. So for example, if I have my red channel open, I could drag down in the lower midtones to introduce uh, cyan into the shadows, or rather, you know what, I'll drag in the opposite direction and introduce red into the shadows, but then drag the other half of the curve in the opposite direction. And that's going to give me this really interesting, almost retro look on the colors. Um, so this is actually called cross-process. It's a reference uh, to older uh, photo development techniques. And in this case, it almost always produces like a really attractive uh, color look. So in this case, um, I've used the opposite ends of the red channel. You can see before and after. I can reset this and try the same thing for a different color and it will uh, pretty much always work. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to lift the bottom half of the blue channel to introduce blue into the shadows, but then lower the upper midtones to introduce yellow, its opposite. And that also gives us a really interesting result. I'm going to keep these control points relatively close uh, to the original line so that the colors are pretty subtle to get this result. All right, if I wanted to look at this clip in full screen, I can use Command F as a shortcut or Control F on a PC, and then continue to use my shortcuts to bypass uh, the node grade. So Command D before and after, and this is me uh, creating that blue and yellow look. If I wanted to bypass the entire pipeline, not just one node, there are a couple of ways I can accomplish this. Uh, first, at the very top of the viewer, you have this icon that looks like a little color wheel with some sparkles next to it. You can click on that 
to completely bypass the entire grid and you'll end up looking at the original video signal. Or you can press Shift D and that will also disable the entire pipeline. And you can see at the very top of the viewer that icon again is getting crossed out to indicate to you visually that you're no longer seeing the grade. Now that we've created a few looks, uh, let's uh, save them for later use. So I will right click within the viewer with uh, my clip two still open and I will select grab still. And now a still will appear in the gallery, which contains, um, as I mentioned earlier, a high quality uh, one frame grab of this video uh, based on the frame that I had open at the time that I grabbed it, but then also all of the color grading data associated with it. I can even uh, click underneath the still to give it a custom name. So in this case, um, this was the cross process look. In case you're unable to reach uh, or to click that area to start labeling a still, you can always right click and choose change label. And you can do the same thing. Let's also grab a still of our first uh, clip. Right click, grab still, and that will appear at the very beginning here. I'll click to select it. And this was more of like a neutron, neutral uh, cyan look. So this is a way that I can collect all of my uh, different grades, my different looks. Uh, something else I could do is also organize these into albums, which is uh, the color pages version of folders or bins. Uh, to access albums, I need to click on the sidebar icon in the top left corner of my media pool. And you can see when I select it, uh, the sidebar opens up and I have my default album stills one. I can double click to highlight its name and I will call this my looks album. Then I can also right click within the sidebar to generate as many new albums as I need. So when I right click, I can add still album and that's my stills too. So it's really quite easy to stay organized uh, when you're working with the gallery. But now the next thing I'd like to take a look at is matching clips to one another. So that is just as important as being able to read scopes, to be able to normalize and balance clips in preparation for the creative grade. But we perform matching for a slightly different purpose. Uh, so primarily it's so that you can have clips playing in a sequence and they all look like they're all part of the same environment. So let's take a look at three clips that I have in the timeline right now. I will disable uh, the loop function in my viewer by clicking on uh, the little orange arrow at the bottom. And I will press spacebar to play through these three airplane sequence clips. And even though topically they all make sense uh, next to each other, they all look extremely different because they were captured on different days on different cameras, you know, and that's, it's perfectly natural for this to happen to footage. So the first clip looks really quite warm. After which you go into this uh, very neutral clip in the middle and then continue into this darker, cooler clip. So we would like all of these uh, to look uh, pretty cohesive. I will begin uh, with the automated uh, match function in DaVinci Resolve because I feel that it's quite powerful um, and really quite useful. Uh, the first thing we need to do is uh, decide on uh, our ideal starting point or our key shot as it's also known. And I think the middle clip in the sequence makes the most sense because it is a very neutral looking shot. It's nice and bright, uh, but also the contrast is appropriate. So we have nice deep shadows and very good highlights that are not blown out. I will select my third clip and right click on clip number four. All right, so this is a very important distinction to remember. The clip that you're changing has to be the one that you have selected but the one that you want to match to is the one that you want to right click and choose shot match to this clip. It might take a moment, uh, but hopefully you will see the colors shift as your opening clip now changes to match the look of the subsequent clip. You can see that both nice and neutral now, they have the same color uh, tarmac even, uh, so that's the ground, uh, same color fuselage on the planes. They both look 
very similar in terms of uh, color balance, but also in terms of contrast, you can see that the shadows underneath uh, the airplane are just as rich in both cases. So now if you were to see this as part of a documentary or a feature, this would look a little bit more natural, like they belong next to each other. We'll try the same thing for clip number five, once again using clip four as my key. So I will have five selected. If you right click uh, the active clip, you will not see shot match to this clip as an option. So you have to make sure that you are right clicking the key instead. Shot match to this clip. All right. And that's also given me a pretty good adjustment. Um, remember, you can continue to uh, disable a node or press a command D to temporarily hide the grade. And there absolutely has been a substantial change, but it may be not strictly as accurate as the previous one had been, and that's perfectly fine. So in this case, um, I can see, for example, that the shadows are much deeper in our key shot. If I look at the wheels or if I look at the engines um, and also refer to the scopes, um, you can see that these fall pretty low down uh, right above uh, the zero point line. But when I look at number five, those points are elevated. So they look a little bit flatter in the viewer and they're also much, much higher um, in terms of the scopes. I will um, go into my primaries palette and drag the lift master wheel to the left to darken that range of the image and try to get it into the same position in the scopes as it was for clip number four. All right, so the shadows are looking much better. I think the highlights are also pretty good. Um, you can see they're a little bit lower perhaps in clip number four, a little bit elevated in uh, number five. So I can drag those down. But then overall, the image I think uh, could use with a brightening. You can see here the spread is much more even, whereas here it's a little bit more concentrated in the upper midtones. So I'll pick up the gamma, drag it upwards slightly. I'm still seeing uh, just a little bit of warmth, um, I think, in this image compared to uh, the key. So once again, we can return to the primaries, switch from wheels to bars, and I am ever so slightly going to lift the blue channel at the very bottom here in the lift so that I don't have as much of a separation of colors at the very bottom of my scopes. So by uh, not even dragging, but just by using the scroll wheel once on the blue bar and raising it by a factor of 0 0.01, uh, my shadows have now started to look more neutral and I've achieved a much better match with clip number four. So this is a really nice on the fly way of color matching, you know, being able to very quickly navigate down a timeline and making sure all the clips match each other, especially if they were captured in the same location and there's enough uh, context, enough visual references for the software to understand what it's seeing and match those elements up. In some cases though, you're not going to have those types of helpful references, in which case you will need to perform all of the shot matching yourself. And that's a very powerful skill to have and I'm about to show you how to do it. I've got these two clips near the end of the timeline, numbers six and seven, which don't really have a very clear reference uh, for white, you know, like a white piece of paper or a white t-shirt, or in this case, the fuselage of a plane. Uh, so here we have a slightly more busy environment in terms of there just being more vegetation, so things with uh, a naturally stronger color cast. Um, we do have some pretty good references for shadows. They don't take up a large portion of the frame, but they are still there, so we know what the deepest shadow should look like. In this case, we also have the same environment, but it was captured at different times of the day, which is another reason why you might often have mismatched footage. We want in the end for the sequence to look like this. We want the warmer daytime look rather than uh, the sort of sunset cooler look. For this, I am first going to grab a reference image. So I'm gonna open up a, a brand new album in the gallery because I don't want this to end up in my looks. I'll select stills two and then I'll right click the viewer when I have uh, clip seven open and choose grab still. There we go. In this case, I'm not grabbing this for uh, you know color grading or look purposes. There's absolutely nothing in the note editor for me to preserve. I need this purely as a visual reference. And in fact, I will label this still as reference in the gallery. 
And that way, that's a reminder to myself that there's nothing important that I'm going to lose in case, you know, I delete it later on. I'm then going to select clip number six, and I am going to double click the reference thumbnail to wipe it in the viewer. So you can see a few changes have occurred in the viewer right now. In the top left corner, I've activated one of the icons, which is the image wipe. And that has now produced a split line down the middle, and it's showing me my reference on the right-hand side and my active clip on the left. On top of that, in the top right corner, I've also revealed a lot of additional controls for how the image wipe behaves. By default, you're going to get this horizontal wipe, where you have a single line in the middle that you can pick up with your mouse and move left and right to you know, pick the ideal point uh, for matching. Uh, but then you also have a lot of alternative wipe modes you know, based on the context of the scene, based on, you know, the placement of your characters. Um, so you can check these out. I think they're pretty self-explanatory. Uh, but in our case, uh, really what we need is this kind of divide where we have a good environmental reference, right? So we can see the ground in both frames. We can see the mountains in the background in both frames. And uh, those, like, few references to shadows are also present in things like uh, the, uh, the dog's face, for example, the wrinkles in the man's clothes. Uh, but then also the horse's uh, eyes uh, and its mane uh, are all going to fall in the same region. I'm going to change my scopes from a waveform to an RGB parade. That makes it really easy to see exactly what the signal strength is of every individual channel in the video. So I'm going to use my pop-up menu to choose parade. And the default setup should be enough. Uh, so we have red, green, and blue. Uh, the actual uh, distribution of the trace is exactly the same as it was with the standard waveform. You're still looking at the signal strength from weakest at the bottom, the black point, to strongest at the top, uh, the white point. And you're still reading it left to right, except now the video signal is a bit compressed. Uh, so it's much more narrow, but it's still the same shape. Um, if I was to jump back into, say, uh, clip number two, hopefully you'll recognize that bright window on the left-hand side, uh, but it's got slightly different strengths for all three channels. So in this case, uh, I am looking at the image on the left, but you can actually see the wipe line uh, between the two as I move it around. Uh, so the parade is giving me a readout of both, uh, which makes it much, much easier to match the two because I just have to get the height correct um, in all three channels. Uh, so matching is a bit different from balancing in that sense because you're not trying to get the three of them to line up perfectly. Uh, rather, you're trying to get them to replicate the relationship of your reference clip. In which case, um, as we're reading this, we can see the blue channel absolutely does have to be reduced because right now it's a bit higher. And the red channel needs to be raised because uh, you can see that the reference image has a slightly elevated red channel. So we are going to perform our match using the Curves palette. I already have a blank node uh, ready, and in fact, I'm going to label this, call it Match. And I'll begin by isolating my red channel, and I will raise its white point to drag the top half of this red parade. And I only need to drag it a little bit. You can see that it starts to match the arc of the reference uh, red parade. And that's perfectly fine for me. I'm, I'm happy with it. I will now do the same thing for the blue channel. Um, so that's a little elevated. I will do the opposite. I will select blue, drag the white point, and lower it. So once again, it matches the arc of the reference. When I look back at the viewer, uh, the color grade is looking very, very close, right? So that's already a very good match. And that just required two very small adjustments uh, to the red and blue channels. One maybe final thing I would like to do is also match uh, the bottom of the green channel, which right now I can see is a little bit elevated in my active clip versus my reference. So I will isolate my green channel, select the black point, and drag it down ever, ever so slightly. Okay. So now we have a pretty good match between the two. In fact, I can disable white, my white mode in the top left corner by selecting uh, this wipe image wipe icon. And I can use my up and down arrow keys 
to cut between the two clips. And then I can also play these back to see how well they match each other. And I think that's looking really nice, much, much closer than what it used to be, which was, of course, this, the much cooler look, followed by the warmer one. Uh, but here's where the real magic starts. Uh, once you've achieved a match between clips, you can now start to design looks for your scene, and you don't have to recreate the look every time you need to use it. You can simply copy and paste it across different clips, and as long as they have the same starting point, they will continue to match. All right? So it's all about getting it out of the way in the first node of the pipeline. For example, in this case, I can create a new node, add node, add serial, and this will be uh, a node for contrast. I will once again use my curves, but this time I will uh, combine all of my channels, I'll gang them, and I will start by maybe dragging the top and the bottom uh, points in opposite directions to really drag out the potential of this image. Uh, because this is a creative contrast look, there's not really as many uh, strong rules around it. So if I start to, for example, clip my shadows, it's not as big a deal. Uh, but let's see, I'm gonna click downwards to maybe deepen the mid-tones, which I think looks really nice. It produces more uh, color, more saturation in the image. And then drag the highlights up to give me a bit more separation to reveal more detail in the ground. Great. Uh, once again, I'll press uh, Command F to see this image. I can press Command D to disable. You can see this is before and after my contrast. And I can also press Shift D to bypass the entire pipeline and see that this was my original image followed by the grade. If I wanted to apply this exact same contrast to the following video, I can select this node in my pipeline and I can either use my edit menu to choose edit, copy, or I can use a standard keyboard shortcut, which is command C or a control C on a PC. Select that. Now I can navigate to clip seven and choose edit and paste or command V, control V. The contrast has been pasted and the look between the two clips has been maintained because they had the same starting point in terms of chrominance. The next thing I'm excited to show you is the filter option in the color page. So remember when we looked at the interface toolbar at the very top, I told you that there were certain panels that you can reveal and hide by pressing on certain buttons. One of those buttons is clips, which collapses your thumbnail timeline underneath the viewer. But if you look right next to the Clips button, you will also see this little drop-down arrow. When you click on it, you reveal a series of filters that you can apply to your timeline. So by default, uh, your timeline will show you all clips, but sometimes you might want to isolate what you're seeing. For example, right before delivering a project, you might wish to check out what all your ungraded clips are if there's anything that you may, may have accidentally skipped or forgotten, when I click on ungraded clips, that leaves just one clip in my timeline, which was uh, that airplane clip that we used you know, as a key shot. So I can select that and I can review this clip. Now this has no impact on your actual edit. If you look at uh, the edit timeline underneath, uh, you could see that all of the clips uh, and their cut points are still present. If I was to jump back into the edit page, my entire timeline is still uh, just as it was. It is only what we're seeing in the color page that changes. Let me go back uh, to my filter and I could select all clips and these all come back. So filters can be incredibly helpful when you're trying to focus on a subset of your media for whatever reason. For example, uh, we have two clips uh, that we're going to be performing secondary grading on in a second. And I will mark them in order to remind myself uh, where they are. One of those clips is number two. So I will right click and I will add a flag to it. 
So I'll select flags and make it yellow. And you can now see a little yellow flag in the top left corner indicating that for whatever reason, this clip has been um, you know, indicated with this flag. And I would also like to mark clip number eight uh, for secondary grading work. So I'm gonna right click, add flag and yellow. I can also add flags in batches. So um, to select multiple clips, I can either hold uh, the command modifier on my keyboard and make multiple selections, or I can also hold the shift key to select a sequence of clips. So with number three highlighted, I've held shift, I pressed number five, and that gave me that exact sequence of clips. I can now right click, choose flags, select blue, and now all of these have adopted a blue flag. So what does this have to do necessarily with organization or the filters that I talked about a second ago? If I go back into my clips filter list, I will find that one of my options for filtering is flags. So I could decide, you know what, for the rest of the afternoon, I only want to focus on this airplane sequence. So I can choose to filter by blue flags, and now I don't have to be distracted by any of the other media on my timeline. And granted, this was a relatively short uh, timeline, there's not too many clips, but when you're working on an episode of a show or a short film or a feature film, you are gonna have potentially hundreds of clips uh, to work through. And it really helps a lot to have flags to indicate uh, exact features that you want to address, you know, that you want to focus on for the day um, and not have to constantly jump back and forth on the timeline. So for this next portion, I'd like to return to our main timeline. I'm going to navigate to the clips uh, drop down menu once again and set it to all clips to remove the filter. And the next thing we'll be doing is working with secondary grading tools. Secondary color grading is when we target only a portion of the frame when we're performing color grading or applying an effect. So we do this primarily using two techniques. Uh, one technique is referred to as masking. Uh, in DaVinci Resolve, we accomplish this using power windows. And in this technique, we are isolating a portion of the frame using a shape, you know, something like something basic like a circle or a square, or even a custom shape that we draw ourselves um, using a vector. And then alternatively, we can also perform secondary grading using keying techniques, which is where you, you select a portion of the frame based on hue, saturation, or luminance. So in DaVinci Resolve, we accomplish this using the qualifier tool. We're gonna use both of these in the next couple of exercises. I'm going to start with uh, clip number two, which we've already worked on. Uh, so here we've uh, performed a balance. Uh, we've applied a creative look and contrast. But in our case, I also want to isolate uh, the face of these scales in order to make the detail here pop out even more. Because that's obviously the purpose of this shot is to get the audience uh, to look at the detail right in the middle. So I'm gonna try to make it as clear as possible. Now, where would you place a node for this type of secondary grade? Uh, so far, we've been mostly keeping things sequential. But in this case, um, I want to work on top of the cleanest version of the signal, so I'm going to place my secondary grade right after the balance node. I will select it, right-click, add node, and add serial. So I'll use my labels to indicate uh, that this will be a secondary grade on the scales, on the scale surface. And for this, it makes the most sense to use a shape. Uh, it's pretty straightforward uh, circular shape. So I will go into my Windows palette. Uh, the icon to enter it looks exactly like uh, a circle. And underneath, you have a series of preset vector shapes. I will select the circular window, and that will immediately appear in the viewer as this little interface that I can interact with. So I can drag the corners to make this window larger. I can click anywhere in the empty space in the middle to move it around as a single unit. I can also stretch it or crush it, pull it in various directions, and also rotate it using the little anchor in the middle. Feel free to also move around the viewer itself. So right now I can't really see the bottom of the shape too well. Um, so I can middle click uh, my mouse, so I can click on the scroll wheel to maneuver around 
so I have a better control over the bottom of the frame. I can also give myself a bit more room by collapsing some of my other panels. For example, um, I very often collapse my timeline panel over here to give the viewer a little bit more breathing room. And remember, it's dynamic. So if I resize some of my other palettes, uh, then it will reshape itself and make it uh, larger. So now I can see my selection a little bit better. I can see that the circle is not perfect, um, and it's kind of up to me to decide whether I'm happy to make this compromise and keep it the shape that it is, or whether I want to be more exact in my selection. Um, in the window options, so that's the three dot menu in the top right corner, I can choose to convert the shape to bezier, which means that I can now break apart this preset shape and turn it into a series of custom points that I can pick up and move around. And every single point has these bezier handles that I can also maneuver around in order to get the best possible angle on this point. So I'm dragging these around using my mouse and then also modifying the handles to get a better selection. This does take a little bit of practice if this is your first time encountering uh, vector shapes or bezier points. Um, but you do get used to it over time. So I'm going to pick the bottom point up. This is my last modification. It's okay that this is uh, outside of the viewer, that it's off screen, uh, because it's all about getting the most accurate shape or arc as possible. All right, so I'm pretty happy with that selection. I can now go into my standard uh, primary controls, my primaries and my curves, and make further adjustments. Uh, this is also a really easy way to get rid of uh, the window interface, that little uh, white outline. It's quite difficult to color grade when you're looking at the shapes. So by clicking on a different palette in the central palettes, I get uh, to get rid of that. Um, so for, in this case, I am going to begin by uh, brightening the overall region using the gamma master wheel. I'm going to click and drag the slider to the right. All right, and you can see how this is already a little bit more uh, appealing. It draws the eye because it's a little bit brighter. I can also adjust the contrast and pivot in the adjustment controls uh, to further enhance uh, the detail. So make the difference between uh, the, the white uh, backplate and the numbers a little bit more enhanced. Great, that's even better. And then finally, I can still use the mid-tone detail to further enhance the detail of the numbers and the little uh, lines running across the perimeter. Great. And I can disable the scales now to see before and after, and you can see how much more vibrant it's become. But because uh, this node is followed by the look and the contrast nodes, they are still affecting the end result in terms of the look, right? So we haven't undone any of that cross process that we created, any of that contrast. So it still fits very well um, into the overall uh, appearance of this clip. If you feel that the edge of your circle is starting to look a little bit harsh, a little bit uh, sharp, you can always return to your window palette and use the softness controls uh, to maybe make it a little bit less uh, dramatic. So that's still gonna be hard to do with uh, the window outline, which means that I can go into my viewer pop-up in the bottom left corner. These are my on-screen controls. These determine what kind of tools or outlines um, I see in the viewer. I'm going to select that and set it to off. And that way I'm still working in the window palette, but I no longer have to see that circular outline. Second, click and drag my softness control, and you can see that makes it really easy to conceal the fact uh, that I have placed a window there. But I don't want to take it too far. I do still want there to be a bit of an edge. So the last thing I need to consider with a shot like this is exactly how it's going to play. I will re-enable uh, the looping function at the bottom of the viewer, and I'm going to play through. It doesn't look too bad, but as the scales swing, they kind of move out of the influence of my power window. If I activate my outline, you can see that as the scales swing forward, they're no longer being graded, and that's not great. So I would like to have the window follow the movement of the scales. That is relatively easy to achieve in the tracker palette. 
you'll find this right next to the power window. So the two of these are actually quite intricately linked. The tracker will always uh, react to any windows that you apply to the viewer. And in fact, um, you can't really run a track in window mode unless you already have a power window enabled. So uh, with the tracker palette open, I have analysis controls accessible to me in the top left corner. I will click analyze forward and keep an eye on the window in the viewer. Because this was uh, quite a short take, uh, it happened very quickly uh, and the track was complete. I can now drag the playhead uh, in the uh, graph in the tracker or even uh, underneath the viewer and move back and forth to check the accuracy of the track. And I think that looks really good. The window is now moving with the scales and my secondary changes have now applied successfully to the whole clip. Something else that involves using power windows that is also a secondary grading change is adding a vignette. So this is another way of drawing the attention of the viewer and redirecting it to a single point. Um, it's used most commonly to pretty much draw us to the center of an image. And traditionally, vignettes were just shadows cast by the matte box around the camera lens. Uh, but now when we work digitally and uh, the shadows off mats are not as much of an issue, we produce them artificially because there is a certain aesthetic quality to them and we do like the way that they can help us frame an image. So I will apply that to the very end of my pipeline. I'm gonna choose my contrast node Right click, add node, add serial. Uh, don't worry if your nodes start to get thrown around uh, the node editor, by the way. Uh, the position of the nodes themselves does not matter so much. The most important thing is the connection line. So as long as the connection is running in the right order, in the right sequence, then you're good. So I can even start you know, a second layer of nodes underneath here. I can also choose to make the nodes smaller by going in the top right corner and you'll find that there's a little scroll bar that allows me to zoom in and out. And I will right click, add a label for my vignette and return to the window palette. Once again, I'm going to activate uh, the circle window preset, uh, but this time I'm going to stretch it out to pretty much fill the frame because that's what a, a vignette is, right? It should just be the darkening of the very edges or the very corners. One of the most important thing about vignettes is that they have to be extremely subtle. As soon as you can see them, as soon as you're aware of their presence, uh, then they immediately become quite distracting. So it's very important that they're nice and gentle on the eye. So I'm gonna use the red point over here to soften the very edge of my circle. I can even see what my selection looks like by going um, into the top left corner and clicking on the magic wand. Right, and that actually gives me my selection. And as you can see, the red point determines the very softness of the edge and allows me to blend it out nicely. I can always, uh, of course, drag it beyond the visibility of the viewer itself, um, either by navigating, by middle clicking and dragging, but also by using the scroll wheel. So I can scroll out of the image and keep dragging that softness. And the final important thing to do for vignettes is to invert my selection. Because right now, if I tried to darken my edges, you know, if I went into, say, my gamma master wheel and I tried to drag it to the left, I will find that it's the center of the image that becomes darker, and that's not what I want. So I'm going to reset and then invert my window in the window palette. So there's my invert button. Now, if I check the highlight mode, you will see that uh, what we're selecting is only the corners of the frame. And I can return to my gamma control, start dragging it to the left, and you will see that it is the edges now that are darkening. Uh, once again, I will want to leave my window palette so that I'm not distracted by the circular outline. And I can also um, zoom back into the viewer. A shortcut for that is to use uh, Shift Z on your keyboard. Not only will it uh, zoom into uh, your frame, but it will also fit it to fill the frame, which means that it will react dynamically to any resizing that you do. So it's a pretty good state to be in. All right, so with that selection made, I can now start to darken the edges of my frame. 
make them a bit more dramatic. If I'm not happy where the shadows are falling, I can return to my window controls and make further changes to the shape. I use vignettes relatively frequently. It's a pretty standard shape and placement. So something I could do is save uh, the placement and the blending or the softness of, of the circle as a preset. I'm gonna go into the options menu of the window palette. And at the very top, you can see save as new preset is an option. I will select that and give it a preset name, vignette. Press OK. And from now on, if I was to go into another clip, I will continue to see vignette as a shape option in the options menu of the window palette. All right, and finally, we are going to go to clip number eight and discover the other half of secondary grading, which is using the qualifier to make selections based on a key of either color values, luminance, or saturation. In this case, uh, we have a clip that we can uh, play through a couple of times of an airplane traveling over some water. All right, so it's just running on loop. And our intention here will be to, for example, turn the water blue. This is very difficult to do using Windows, obviously, because it will require you to, you know, outline the airplane, you know, get that exact shape and then also track it. But it's much, much easier to do based on color values because the green water is so distinct and there is nothing else green in the footage. So it will be pretty easy to extract. We already have a balance node present on this clip. Feel free to uh, explore this if you're following along. You can deactivate this node to see what it looked like before. And this image was also a little bit flatter. Uh, there was not as much distinction in the details uh, in the water and also like amongst the highlights and the shadows. Whereas with the balance in place, you can actually see where the clouds were in the sky and where you have like a, a shadow of the airplane. So these details are a little bit more pronounced. Um, they're gonna make the final image look quite good. Uh, but in our case, we want to generate a brand new node with which to perform essentially a, a green key. So I'm going to right click the balance node, add node, add serial, and I will call this uh, blue water. And then I will navigate to the qualifier palette right next to the power windows. There we go. And here you can see that we have three standards upon which uh, we are making selections. Uh, so that's hue, saturation, and luminance. You can start interacting with these parameters right away, or you can click in the viewer to take a sample of the color that you want to select. So the quickest way to do this is simply to click once in the viewer, and you will immediately see a series of selections in these bars in the qualifier palette. You can also click on the wand, so the highlight mode in the viewer, to see what your selection looks like. So yes, it has grabbed that distinct shade of green, but it hasn't really grabbed all of the water. So I'm gonna try this again, but instead of clicking one time, I am going to click and drag, and that will allow me to grab a much wider sample of color. I'm going to press the global reset for the qualifier in the top right corner, so that resets all of the parameters down here, and then go back into the viewer, and I'm going to click and drag across the water, making sure to get a full range of the, the luminance values, you know? So we have the lighter green at the top, we have the richer green at the bottom, and even like a slightly warmer green in the bottom right corner. And as I clicked and dragged, my selections in the qualifier parameters grew. Right, they expanded to include a wider range of prominence, hues, saturation, and luminance. When I click on the highlight mode in the viewer, I will see that that selection now looks much more solid. So you should see mostly green water, maybe still a few uh, areas that have not been picked up, but that's fine, we can now refine this. So if we go back to the qualifier controls, you can continue to interact uh, with all of these. Um, I can click and drag the edges of my qualifier selection. And as I do so, you will notice that uh, the selection in the viewer is affected. So I'm getting few and few of those gray spots. And gray, when you're in highlight mode, means that an, an area has not been selected. So it's good that the airplane is gray and the birds, uh, but everything else, all the water should be green. And that's not looking too bad. 
if I still found, you know, that there were areas that were not being selected, uh, despite the color, you know, range seemingly being represented, I could then continue to make changes to saturation and luminance. Uh, but once I'm done with these three, I can also now go into the top right corner of the viewer where I have some highlight specific controls. So I can change the way that uh, my selection is being represented from highlight mode, which gives me that kind of color and grayscale representation, which we've been using so far, or I could switch it to highlight black white, which will give me a matte representation of my selection. So here I can see that uh, whatever is represented as white or opaque white is fully selected. Uh, anything that's black is not selected. So we wanna make sure that we don't have any spots, um, any dots visible, and also that you know there's no selections like on the airplane itself. To clean up your selection when you're in this mode, black and white, you want to use the matte finesse controls on the right-hand side of the qualifier palette. So denoise is a very popular choice because that will get rid of a lot of like the smaller issues that you might have with the edges of your selections and with the object that you have. So for example, that sort of cleaned up a lot of the issues I had inside the airplane. And then clean black and clean white, uh, you can almost think of as master wheels. So if something was already uh, pretty dark, but there was a few white flecks in it, then clean black is just gonna get rid of those last remaining bit of noise. And then I can also use clean white to get rid of some of the noise around the birds. And then if you feel like you want to add a bit of softness to your edge, you can also use something like blur radius. I tend to leave that until after I start color grading to make sure that I can justify the level of softness as opposed to just guessing. Um, but in that case, uh, I'm really, really happy with this selection. So I think we've got a really clean extraction of the water. I'm gonna turn off highlight mode and I can now start to perform uh, the color grade. There's a lot of different ways that I can achieve this. Um, in fact, that's something you'll find uh, about the color page and also a lot of like other, I suppose, creative processes is that there's never just one way to accomplish something. There's a lot of different tools that will do something similar. And the only real difference is in the speed with which you can get the result that you need and also the, uh, the clarity or the quality. So in our case, uh, we are going to go with speed, we're gonna apply a really quick change to the colors by isolating the blue channel in the curves palette and dragging the black point up in order to make blue the dominant color in this selection. So I can drag it up pretty high and I can play through this clip to see that uh, those elements that were not included in our selection are not being affected by the grade. So if I go back to my black point and I raise it up and down, you can see the airplane and the birds are untouched. But even with the water turned blue, I can continue to refine it using some other tools. Uh, so for example, I might decide, hmm, this is very saturated. So I might wanna tone it down by going into the adjustment controls at the bottom of the primaries and making this a more natural blue as opposed to like that really intense, like almost plastic looking blue. Something else I can do is uh, use my hue a parameter to rotate the hue of the water. So we've already done most of the work by turning it blue, but now I can refine exactly what shade of blue I want it to be. So if I drag it to the left, I start to go closer to magenta and pink and red, which we don't really want. Um, or if I drag it to the right, I might turn it into a more inviting, like a, a warmer blue. And then if I keep dragging it to the right, then eventually I'll turn it green. So I wanna kinda keep it close to the original range, but maybe a little bit further to the right. All right, and that takes care of the water. We've turned it blue. But you might be looking at this image and thinking like, well, what about all these birds at the end? It feels like they're still quite desaturated and colorless. I think in the original footage, if we uh, press Shift D and we turn off the entire pipeline, you can see that they had a hint of pink. You know, So these were clearly flamingos and we've now lost a little bit of that color. So it'd be really nice to bring it back. The great thing about working with nodes is that you never have to repeat a workflow and you never have to like really copy and paste so much when you're working within one image. You can just reuse a signal as many times as you need to. In this case, I would like to 
continue working on this selection that we've made with the water, but just redirect my attention to the birds. So I'm going to right click on my latest node. And I will add a new node, but this time I will choose to add an outside node. And what that is going to do is, uh, once again, make a standard corrector like we've been using this whole time, but it will invert any kind of uh, key data that your current node has. So I'm going to click Add Outside. And for the first time, we're seeing a brand new connection. It's this blue one. And it is actively inverting what we've just created in the blue water node. But now when I click on highlight, I will see that the white is focusing on the airplane and the birds. And if I switch back to highlight mode, you can see that those are the elements that we will be affecting when we color grade. So with this, we can color grade the birds. I'm going to right click, node label, flamingos. If we were to start making changes uh, in any of our primary tools right now, we would also be affecting the airplane. And that's not something I want to do. So I will need to first isolate it from our selection. We can go into the window palette for this and simply create a subtractive window that will extract what we don't need. So this is a really fun thing about secondary tools is that you can mix and match them, you can combine them. Oftentimes, the qualifier will do a lot of the heavy lifting for you by making a selection based on color, but you might still need to use the Windows palette to isolate things you know, that you want to keep or maybe subtract things that you don't. So I will um, click on the circle preset, pick it up and drag it right over the airplane in the viewer, and then resize the circle to make sure it's not overlapping any of our birds. Uh, I'm also going to make sure that you'll see that the airplane never leaves the confines of that circle. So as I drag my playhead to the left, um, I see that it very slowly exits the frame and disappears like so. I will switch back into highlight mode and I will find that the only thing I can see right now is the airplane. And that makes sense because by default, all windows are additive. So it is keeping you know, what I've selected. I want to do the opposite. I want to invert that shape. So now I'm keeping everything that's outside of it. I've made it into a subtractive window. And this all looks good. So I can turn off my highlight mode, go back to my primary tools and turn those birds pink. This time we can use uh, the wheels. So because they're all very bright, um, I will use the gain wheel for that. Remember that goes after the highlights of the image. And I can drag my control point towards pink or magenta to give them a little bit of color. Now they might look really quite saturated, quite extreme, uh, but something you have to keep in mind is how shortly they are present in the sequence, really. So it's only just a few frames, maybe 12 or so frames at the end of the clip that they come into view. In that case, it's okay to leave the colors a little extreme. It's okay to leave uh, the selection you know, as is because we will have just enough time as an audience to process that they're there before the clip cuts to something else in the timeline. So I've pressed uh, Shift Z to reposition my viewer and I'm gonna play through this video. We've got nice blue water under the very yellow airplane and then all these pink flamingos coming in at the very end. And that wasn't too difficult to accomplish. Thank you so much for joining me for this overview of the color page. In the next video, we're going to be looking at some more advanced concepts like an introduction to color management, looking at the node editor and achieving non-destructive grading workflows, and also the HDR palette and a few other new tools. If you have any questions or if you need any advice on using the color page, I highly recommend that you check out the Blackmagic Design Forum. And to gain access to all our other training materials, check out the training page on blackmagicdesign.com where you can learn all the other pages as well as gain certification for all of them.